Hello, I'm Jason from the Class Consciousness Project and uh, returning to talk with me again is Mandy Clare. Mandy Clare is a counsellor for Cheshire West and Chester Council and she's going to talk to us about her experience at the Chester Story House Women Weekend on the 2nd of March. Mandy, thanks for joining me again. Hiya, thanks for inviting me. You're well, very welcome. Now, my, my interest was piqued and the reason why I asked you to come back on here to talk with me again was a, a short, about a four minute long YouTube video that I saw on Twitter um, where you attended the, the Chester Story House Women Weekend, which took place over a weekend of a Saturday and Sunday, the, the 2nd and 3rd of March. But you were there on the 2nd mm -hmm. and um, you asked some questions of the people who were on the stage, um, who you could tell the people watching who those people were and why you asked the questions. But what was your experience of that of that day? You asked some questions. Some would say very legitimate questions. Um, but what was your experience of what happened on the day and also your interaction with a, a certain individual that's on the stage? OK, uh, so the reason that I was at that event was that um, sort of winding back a few months, I've been as a local councillor, I've been using my role to um, use my, my platform and my voice to raise concerns which could be considered under the banner of gender critical. Um, and I've found that I've faced a lot of silencing and there's been a lot of abuse online as a result of me doing that, including from other councillors um, within the council, but they've been able to do that with impunity in relation to how the council deals with conduct complaints and also in relation to how the police uh, respond to crime reports and things like that, uh, harassment. So I had wanted a group um, of women with gender critical, similar sex realist views to come along to council meetings so that it's not just me as a lone voice saying, this is a concern, or I'd like more information about what we're doing with our policy around schools, including you know, trans inclusion or whatever it is, the impact on girls' safety, um, free speech, et cetera. If it's just a councillor standing up and saying that, the Labour Party on block feel quite able and justified to vote down debate, to vote against it on block, and that's what they do every time. So over the course of the last couple of years, I've taken a number of different motions to council, which have been on really critically important issues, including child safeguarding concerns. Um, and every time they've just slammed it closed um, because they have the lion's share of the vote. And the Tories, who are their main opposition, have increased in confidence, but not enough to, obviously, even if they all voted in favour, it wouldn't be enough to tip the balance. So I wanted women, um, I wanted a local women's group. I wanted to show women that there was a place they could land if they were feeling silenced or they were feeling frustrated or they wanted to get involved in terms of local activism. And I asked the Women's Rights Network if I could set up a local branch in Cheshire. But since that time, um, although I've advertised that that's an opportunity for women, I've been so busy and so wrapped up in kind of uh, having to put in police crime reports, provide evidence of the abuse that's going on in respect of my freedom of speech as a councillor um, and just the day-to-day -day responsibilities of being a councillor that I've not really had a lot of time to invest in to grow in that group. So um, some women from locals, um, local women's right network branches kindly got in touch with me and said um, they had a couple of actions going on. One weekend they were going and leafleting in, in the city centre in Chester and they invited me along and I said I'll go if I can and then I just got swamped and I couldn't go. So I was feeling guilty. So when they told me that they'd applied for a stall at this women weekend event at Story House, did I want to be involved? I said, yeah, you know, that I, I felt like I should put the effort into it. And it was nice that they were coming to Chester. I felt like that was my job as the coordinator of the Cheshire branch. And I just really hadn't had time to do it. So, um, so then I didn't hear anything for a while. And then the next time they got in touch, they said, right, we applied to have a stall to give out women's right network. Um, leaflets and they enthusiastically accepted us at story house but they also said we need people for our panel we've got a guest uh patsy stevenson um and she's she was known for the photograph that went viral of her she was being restrained by several sort of big uh, male police officers at the sarah everard vigil when sarah everard was uh, murdered and and yeah. um and that happened that was during lockdown. The police had a heavy handed response and that picture of her being restrained on the floor and looking up at the camera went viral. So since then, she's had a platform to campaign on women's rights. 
but the women's rights um volunteers it's a very sort of mild-mannered organization it's not your it's not your full-on shouty sort of um says saying it loud and straight kind of it's more like yeah. the women's institute of women's rights yeah. <laughs> and um they're just lovely lovely women no intention of causing any disruption whatsoever in fact actually very worried about how that might appear in terms mm. of optics if they were to do that um but they'd been knocked back so they, they'd they'd consulted with women's rights network they'd said it's patsy stevenson it's a panel shall we go on the panel and they'd been advised there's a tendency there to misrepresent women with gender critical views and under no circumstances would we advise that you should be on that panel. So they politely contacted Storyhouse and they said, um, we want to, we still want to do the stall and let women know that we're here as an organization, give out our leaflets and talk to people, participate in the events of the weekend. Um, but we're going to politely withdraw from being on that panel because our values are, we, we exclude men from women's spaces. That's our kind of ethos. And um, it doesn't chime with Patsy's own approach because Patrick Patsy is known to be sort of um against that position. So Storyhouse's response apparently to the women was if you're not going to be on the panel, um, you may as well not do any of it. And we only really want to invite women whose values chime with the storyhouse's values, which it doesn't sound like yours do. So they withdrew the offer of a stall from the women. So the women contacted me and they said, We're going to go along we're going to leaflet outside the venue some of us might attend we might ask questions we don't know what we're going to ask there was a very loose plan to attend there was a concern that we weren't going to appear to be disruptive because that wasn't the intention really it was just to have a presence um and that's what we did so i i um i attended as a local councillor um i asked my my um um uh, my friend to, to come along as well, who's another local councillor who seconds the motions that I put forward. Um, and they weren't even sure on the day. They just came over for a bacon butty and have a see what was going on and meet some of the women. They weren't even sure if they were going to attend and they ended up buying their ticket last minute for this this, this uh, panel event. And it was only once we got inside the actual event that I looked on my phone and I saw that Patsy Stevenson had tweeted out something about these women who'd been excluded and who were leafleting outside in the rain. It was freezing cold outside. Really mild-mannered women, like one of them had crocheted a shawl in the in the suffragette colours. Right. <laughs> That's kind of the, the yeah. kind of activism that we're talking about. No kind of threat to anyone. And it was it, it was all it was all the leaflets and everything. It was all um, within what is our legally legally protected um, right. You know, to to express ourselves. But she tweeted out that these women had apparently um, that she she referred to them as GC. There's a group of GC outside. So GC meaning gender critical. So it wasn't even GC women or GC people or GC leaflets. It was just this group of GC outside the venue. Um, and that the word was that they were there to cause disruption, capture it on film in order to um, you know, discredit, dis to cause discredit. And, to, and, and the, I think the word aggressive was used. So it was a complete misrepresentation of these women. And I was quite shocked to read this on Twitter as I'm sitting there in this session with this person on the stage. And then during, during the end session, Patsy also stated that she was in favor of people having freedom of speech and the right to protest, regardless of their views. She kind of said, whether I agree with them or not, that's a fundamental right within our you know, society. It's part of our democratic um, system. And that she supported that right. I think she's opposed to, to the clampdowns, the current clampdowns on um, the right to protest. And that's one of the main things that she talks about when she does use her platform, her women's rights platform. So because she'd said that, and because these women, they weren't even really protesting, they were just handing out leaflets, you know, um, they'd been so maligned and misrepresented in her tweet. I just couldn't resist the opportunity to ask her straight up, if you support freedom of speech, if you support the right to protest, why have you misrepresented these women? You know, and do you understand that the reason that they've been excluded is because they are fighting for, you know, rapists, victims, not to have to refer to their rapist as she in court, for that crime not to be reported as if it's been committed by a woman in the media, for women who are disabled to have the right to same-sex intimate care, they don't want to have a complete stranger, you know, a bloke they've never met from Adam coming in to give them, same, to give them um, intimate care if they're not well or they're older. 
um, women in prisons, you know, to have the right to be in a single sex environment and not have to share the environment with rapists and pedophiles, for example, which is something that's actually happening that people don't realize is happening. And it's kind of not to be stripped an intimate search by officers just because that officer says he's a woman, you know? Um, that's what they're that's what they're there campaigning for, and they don't want to be outside in the rain. It really should have been included. And then the response to that from the stage from Patsy was that she's in favor of freedom of speech, but not if it's hurting people, and that um that what people are doing is transphobic and could lead and, and it's it's dangerous and that it could lead to trans people being murdered yeah and then she asked me to leave and then she turned to the staff and said can you remove her please which they then came over to me and they proceeded to pick up my things and tell me that i needed to leave so. yeah and that that was how it transpired and and it was striking wasn't it that that patsy said that that she was fully in favor of of free speech until mm -hmm. as you say she said it hurt somebody now yeah. hurt is a very broad broadly defined term isn't it you know mm -hmm. i mean you've got uh, uh a phenomenon um across a certain uh section of society where having someone who has an opposing view to them causes them harm i mean i'm reminded of the uh recent issue that affected riley Gaines when she went to speak at an event in a, a san francisco university and was accused of causing harm to the people that had basically barricaded her into a, a room for hours. I think it ended up being four hours uh, mm. before they said they would release her if they got money for it. Um, so, yeah, it was it was quite ironic that she said she was well, like she welcomed free speech and then had you thrown from the from the building. <laughs> I think that's why it's gone a little bit viral, is that it's the juxtaposition, it's the, you know, kind of um, hypocrisy. Yeah. Oh, you know, and also, the staff told uh, us that, uh, in fact, it was said from the stage right from the very beginning of the session. So when the staff approached me, they were saying things like, it's a women's event, you're making it about something else, which I absolutely wasn't. The questions that I asked were, and legally I have a right to ask them, and they were just about women. They weren't about anybody else. They were just about women and women's rights. And that's what that event was supposed to be about. And then I, I was told that... Um, I was told that I'd upset people, I'd upset Patsy, I'd said things that had upset Patsy and caused upset to some people in the audience. And that the event was for celebrating women. Well, I'd been to an earlier session in the morning, a panel session, when they that was the opening of the actual weekend event. Um, and on that panel, there was the director, the artistic director of, of Story House, and then a bunch of other women. And in her very first opening sentence the director explained that the event was for celebrating women and also for having urgent conversations it wasn't just for celebrating women it was supposedly for having urgent conversations and to me there are no more urgent conversations to be had at the moment than you know this issue particularly in relation to sort of over half of the population um and, and the vulnerabilities that we experience just as a result of our sex you know and the issues that are happening with that and um so it was just quite, it was really heavy handed, the response. It sounded like they, she'd said, she's a transphobe, get, please can you get rid of her? Thank you. And they carried on calling me a transphobe. So we've got other recordings from people who were in different positions in the room. Um, and you can hear what she's saying on some of these other recordings a lot more clearly than you can on mine, because I was away back from the stage. Um, and she basically, during that time where the staff member was telling me I needed to leave and, and picking up my things, um, she carried on saying, you know, this is transphobic. I'm so sorry for anyone who's had to listen to this. It's absolutely disgraceful. You know, she carried on and on and on. The staff, from my point of view, they shouldn't have been, um, they shouldn't have been biased. They shouldn't have been taken. That that wasn't a good enough reason for me to have to leave. Um, uh, she'd obviously taken offense to what I'd said. Obviously some of the people in the room agreed with her, but it wasn't, there wasn't a huge crowd gathered to hear her speak. And there were probably more women outside leafleting than there were inside the room. So, you yeah. know, I, I don't think, uh, they didn't have any, I think they, they, they have a legal right as a venue to evict anyone for any reason, any reasonable reason. But from my point of view, discrimination against someone on the basis of their protected views is not a good reason. It's not reasonable. No, no, it's not. And, and as you say, it was it, it certainly comes across in the YouTube video. It was quite a sparsely attended event. Mm 
mm. uh, unless there was a massive crowd of people off camera that that you couldn't spot. Um, but to to quote from the 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 Storyhouse Women Weekend website, they said it was a, an event for a, a vibrant celebration of empowerment and connection and a place of urgent conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, the the evidence of the video doesn't accord with that that ethos, does it? And it's that the the fact that you had a a, a view that was in opposition to a patsy on the stage led to you being basically thrown out, didn't it? I was thrown out, and then I was. So Women's Rights Network had been correct in their assessment. When they'd said to the women, don't go on, we really strongly advise you not to share, share go on a panel with her. You'll be misrepresented, um, very likely. And that's exactly kind of what happened. So after the event, obviously I put that video out because I wanted to show people what had happened. And I'm lucky in the sense that as a counsellor, I do have something of a platform. It's not incredible. It's not like loads and loads of people, but I've got something. It's better than nothing, you know. And... Um, and the story house had described the event as having that there was disruption that we attended and caused disruption, and this was reiterated by Patsy in subsequent tweets as well. Which you know, and then um, a, the local councillor who is responsible for that ward that story house is in, um, he tweeted, or we, he tweeted something really appalling, and then on his own personal Facebook, he'd actually described the behaviour and the views as bigoted. You know, that kind of really inflammatory language, which I get used against me again and again and again. But like I said, including by other counsellors, that's, I could, you know, that it's more than hurtful. That's the kind of language which, when it was used against Kelly J. Keane when she went to New Zealand, ended up in her life being under threat. She almost yeah. got pushed to death by the crazy, angry mob. You know, this is the kind of thing that is actually, that is actually uh, causing a danger and could result in someone being murdered. That's yeah. the reality. You know, yeah, so. that is that is unfortunately the, the reality. And and as you say, words like bigot and transphobe are, are, are thrown around uh, very carelessly these days, aren't they? When when in, in most cases, in fact, almost all cases, yeah, it's it's against what is a cogently reasoned argument against an ideology that can affect over half the population, as you say. Yeah. And she didn't answer the question. So my questions to her were reasonable. If she's a women's rights advocate, she should be able to answer very, very basic questions like that. Even if it's to say, I don't think that's a problem. I don't have a problem with men in women's prisons. I don't care who turns up to give someone intimate care if they're disabled and they're female. You know, the dignity aspect of it, I don't think that's an issue. If that was her honest opinion, that would have been easy enough for her to say, but the response from people when you put them on the spot on these issues, instead of listening and conversing and having those urgent conversations which is what story have said that event was for they just fail and they just call people names that's it that's yeah. the standard response and i just think god you know that's the level that we're at in terms of meaningful debate and that's the caliber of speaker that they've invited onto that platform i would really like to see um story house having to answer in court for what they've done because women at the moment if we want to speak about these issues we have to meet outside and we have to be screamed and yelled abuse at by crowds of people mainly men um with police standing right by them not taking any action against this we're called names we're denigrated we're threatened sometimes women are injured um as happened in let women speak in birmingham and um there's no action taken against these people you know so i just i just think i would like we shouldn't be having to meet outside in those circumstances our views are legitimate and venues it, it shouldn't only be the case that they are, um, you know, they, they'll, maybe they will cancel events like that screening of um, adult human female film that was cancelled by, uh, you know, various different venues across the country. As soon as it gets closer to the event, the trans activists have contacted the, the venue and said, do you realise what we will do to your reputation if you host these women in this film? The next thing it gets cancelled, that can happen three or four times before they find somewhere that will host them. And then the sabotage is so aggressive, half the time it can't be shown anywhere. You know, they have yeah. to have closed invitation lists. They can't advertise where the venue is publicly in order to show this film. That's the kind of thing that's happening to women. And I, I just think I want that to stop. I don't want it to be just that you're getting cancelled. I don't even, I want it to be that they proactively, if they have a programme of events for women, 
or any program of events for any of the protected equality strands that they have a balance and they have to platform women and they have to allow open discussion and debate of the legally held concerns that, that we hold um, as sex realist women. I want to see that happen. So if I can make that happen through my position and what's happened to me um, through taking a crime report through the police, then I will. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And you and you mentioned earlier about about your comrades who have been threatened um, and have been injured um, in taking part in process, often under the very noses of the of the police. And it's the it, it's the inactivity of the police in these circumstances that's quite concerning. I mean, what what do you think it is that's motivating the police to be not so much standoffish as to literally back out of enforcing the law? I think what it is, it's the same thing as um, what happened at Story House. It's the same thing that's happening within councils, within the media, within the criminal justice system as a whole, government at all levels. All public sector organisations, they've been drowned and drenched in an ideology that is hostile to women and women's rights and women's language. You know, So we're not even, we're told that we have to describe ourselves as cis, which is making us a subset of our own sex you know our language is being coerced and controlled so that you know we're regarded as bigoted and that we're, we're silenced as a result and that's happened within the police force as well which is just it's just shocking that that can even happen it can even happen at all but our local police force within cheshire they were signed up to stonewall's equality Employ employment equality index um award scheme as was Cheshire West and Chester Council. Now we relinquished our membership of that scheme in 2015 within the council, but all of the policies are still concreted into place and all of that culture that took place when that all that training was, and when they're trying to earn these points to work their way up this ranking system, um, the whole organization gets rainbow drenched. And by rainbow drenched, I don't mean it's an issue, the plain rain, rainbow flag, which is just the normal one that we used to have for LGB, I don't mean that. I mean this other one that was incursion into it, like in a aggressive triangular shape of an ideology that that prohibits women from speaking freely about our concerns, about our own rights and protections. And within the police um, force in Cheshire, they were the when this new blanket um, directive came out from the NPCC, so it's National Police and Crime. I can't remember, but NP, the, 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 all of the um, chief uh, constables from all of the police forces of the UK are on this NPCC. They gave a directive blanket across the whole of the country that um, all forces should adopt this policy where any any male officer who says he's female can strip an intimate search a woman suspect. Um, likewise, like uh, uh, female police officers are then forced to have to you know, strip an intimate search someone if they say that they're a woman, whether they are or not. And we were the first, Cheshire was the first, we implemented it the very same month that directive came out. Um, and although they claim to have done an equality impact assessment, when I've asked them what, would the, what was the date that started and finished, can I see a copy of it, and which women's organisations were consulted about that, how were female staff and women within the local area informed about that? Tumbleweed, nothing at all. But because, because I've contacted the police uh, and crime commissioner about a number of different issues around police bias in connection with women's rights, um, and in action on, on crime reports that I've submitted, et cetera, and I've been ignored. I actually attended a meeting that he held with local councillors and I kind of put him on the spot. And as a result of that, I managed to get a couple of meetings, lengthy meetings with two senior officers uh, within the force. And as a result of that meeting, they've agreed to reopen those crime reports. So I've been, the last few weeks, I've just been gathering more evidence for them because the abuse that was happening when they were closed, when those crime reports were closed, is ongoing. And so we're still getting abuse. And we've had actual threats of harm that have, cases have been closed on. Whereas on the opposite side of the coin, I was called by the police a couple of years ago and they asked me to change a, a tweet, uh, not a tweet, a, a post that I'd made on my council page. And I, and I said to them, I, I don't think I've said anything that's illegal or hate speech on that post, do you? And they said, no, 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 no. It's not hateful and it's definitely not illegal, but it just might hurt some people's feelings. We've had some complaints. We've been around to someone's like, this thing that you're saying again, it's about hurting feelings as opposed to actual threats of harm against us. They've gone round to someone's house just to hear their hurting feelings and then phone me and ask me to change something as a locally elected representative, impinging on my freedom of speech 
whilst admitting that there was nothing hateful or, or illegal about what I'd said. Um, and yet we've had threats of harm against us, which have been quite severe. And they've dropped, they've dropped those investigations with that. Also, um, smear leaflets that were put out against us, which are not only harassing, but also breach electoral law, because it happened in the pre official pre-election period, full of lies, absolutely damning lies, absolutely full. Um, and the police closed that. And we've only found out recently since it's been reopened that way back when we'd asked them to investigate them, they'd found that, um, they found that, so that it, they were satisfied that it was based on fact. They didn't ask us. It was written about two of us who were candidates that were challenging Labour as independents. They didn't ask us. Their investigation didn't even go as far as knocking on our door and saying, have you got any evidence that you've said this is false information? Have you got any evidence to verify that? Because we easily could have done. But they didn't even do that. They just closed it. Thankfully, they've reopened it. Whether we'll get a fair investigation or not, I've got no idea. I don't know. No, it's... it's... It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, like, like, like you said, the use of the word hurtful is a, a useful cudgel for your, your political opponents to use to beat you with, isn't it? Um, and it, it's it's being used to close down open debate on what is a very contentious issue. Yeah. Uh, but it's also being used by the police. I mean, the, 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 what what stuns me slightly is, is how the police could get themselves involved in a post that you made that mm -hmm. was neither illegal nor hateful and yet they still felt it necessary to advise you to reword it yeah it's quite it's quite extreme the situation that we're in and i think yeah. um it's hard to know what the game plan needs to be when you're in that situation because although at the national level we've had a few um it's not like there's been no progress we can't say that there hasn't been so in terms of um, puberty blockers for children, we know that recently the government has taken a stronger stand on that and said that they're banning it. There are loopholes. And whenever there are loopholes with these things, as with the school's guidance, the draft school's guidance that came out, that all that means, if you leave that loophole, it means that you haven't really, as a government, looked at what the evidence is. Is there any good, strong evidence that socially transitioning children in school, telling them that they might have been brought in the wrong body if they're gender non-conforming, actually helps that child in any way? Is there any good evidence? Because if not, we shouldn't be experimenting with children socially like that. We should be leaving well alone. Um, and the same with puberty block blockers and the same with cross sex hormones and the same with the whole, the whole shebang. These are children. We don't experiment on, on children. And if that's a blanket principle, there should be no loopholes. There shouldn't be any at all, you know? Um, yeah. It's not something that we've ever done. With any other aspect of medicine, if you've got children that are anorexic and they believe that they're fat when they're thin, we don't we don't indulge that. We don't we don't go down experimental routes with that. We just take care of them and we try to help them healthily to accept themselves as they are. You know, so without really good evidence that doing that traditional approach is is actually going to cause more harm than good, and we don't have that evidence, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be experimenting on children. But um, so, so although it appears that we've had these positive step, steps forward, the the um, the end result is that there are loopholes in terms of medicalization of kids and social transitioning of kids and indoctrination of, of, of kids in school with an ideology, no idea if it's harmful or helpful. The best evidence suggests it's harmful, you know, and um, then at the local level, if you've got captured policy, captured organisations that think it's mean, it's mean to ask questions about these things, nothing's going to change at that local level where the rubber meets the road. And that's the job of councils. That's the job of local police forces, you know, and arts venues, all of it. It's all it's all implicated, really. And um, so I think that when you're at that point where you're being silenced, you can't have a debate locally. Crazy child protection situations arise and red flags arise. And you cannot even get an email back from council leaders as a locally elected councillor as to whether they acknowledge that's happened, what they're going to do to prevent it, you know, next time around. I just think, what, coming on to what Kelly J. Keane is doing with the Party of Women, that's the only option that we've got now. We're in really desperate times. Scotland's just had the freedom of speech shut down yesterday. Um, can't be messing about. I think, I think we have to take the fight directly to them and embarrass the hell out of them. It might not mean that we get loads of people elected, but we've got no choice at this stage, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're, you're you're probably right. I mean, the um, you mentioned puberty blockers. The, the Class Consciousness Project, we wrote an article uh, last week on 
the NHS ban on puberty blockers. And in making that ban, like you said, there were some caveats to it. There are some loopholes uh, that can still be put, gone through. But one of the things the NHS said that was quite striking was that there wasn't the evidence base to support the use of puberty blockers in adolescent children, mm -hmm. which obviously begs the question, then why were they giving them in the first place? If there wasn't the evidence base before and there isn't now, why why were children like Kira Bell, who went on to puberty blockers, I believe, at the age of 15? What? Why was it allowed to happen? Why did it take so long for the NHS's higher ups to think, hmm, there's not a lot of evidence to back up what we're doing here. We should stop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the thing is, when puberty blockers then said they're given to, to kids who are confused about their gender, they're given off label, aren't they? Yes. So they've not been trialed at all, as you've said, in terms of that usage of them. Then normally, if they're given to children for any reason, it's if that child has a precocious puberty. So they've started puberty like many years too early and they're used to kind of put, put a hold on that and stay yeah. that off until it's the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. because it will be really traumatic for that child otherwise. And then they're only given for the shortest possible amount of time because it's known the impacts they have on children's bones, um, you know, on, on risk of cancer, um, the brain development, you know, all of these different things that it's known that um, it's not, it's a really strong drug. It's not something that you want to just be given experimentally to anyone, really, let alone children, developing children who've not even been through, through puberty yet. So they were used sparingly and cautiously previously. And like you say, what the hell? Why, why would that change? And no one will explain. No one answers those questions. These people seem to be almost completely unaccountable to the public and they shouldn't be because it's the NHS. We all pay for it. So yeah. I have no idea. I just don't know. All I know is that <clears throat> all of this stuff has happened under the radar. Um, I only became aware of it a couple of years ago, you know, just through a chance conversation on a lefty WhatsApp. I was quite shocked. I was quite shocked anyone because I thought we all understood why women need protection, why children need protection, why men and women are. The fact that men and women are different, the fact that criminality and behaviour um, is different. I thought we all knew that was so well established. And, and through knowing that and having so much evidence around that, that it would be impossible for anyone to go down that route or suggest that sex doesn't matter. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. It's just bizarre. I don't know. Yeah, well, it seems it seems to me, and I think you've mentioned it earlier on, where you where you have um, uh, a sort of ideological recalibration. I think is the best way I can put it of the of things like the police, the judiciary, the media, um, you know, uh, the political class, where all these people who let's be blunt about it, they know about these distinctions between men and women and why there are separate spaces for both. They've chosen to ignore it, haven't they? in in the name of activism in the name of being mm -hmm. kind in inverted commas yeah. um that's the only that's the only answer i can give to it i don't know whether you've got a different view uh no i think that they're fully aware i think they are i think it's cowardice um they know they know this um the counselors that i'm working with they all know they're all fully aware i think what's difficult is when people have dug themselves in ideologically and they take the stand and they've called you all all kinds of names and made out that you're bigoted and you're stupid. It's a very difficult thing to climb down from. And we've yeah. been saying this within the kind of gender critical circles, if you want to call it that, for years. People have been saying, what's the climb down going to, going to look like? And most people have been of the view that it's just going to be, they're going to ignore that they ever said it. They're going to pretend that they ever said those things. And they're going to come out with things like, well, as we've said all along, blah, 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 blah. And that is what's starting to happen in some corners. But... um. Not enough. It'd be great if we could hear more people saying that because it would mean that the tide was actually turning. But yeah. there's still far too many people digging into their position, um, unevidenced position on this and the abuse as well, you know, for us to be able to feel hopeful, I think, at the moment just yet. Yeah. I mean, the situation you talk about where um, people have got themselves so entrenched and so ensconced in their position, it's very difficult to get themselves back out of it. I liken to the Owen Jones situation, isn't it? He He's someone who has gone all in on this ideology um, and made himself rather foolish or look rather foolish at times and said some quite uh, spiteful, misogynistic things as well in defence of his position. But it's because he's gone so all in 
Mm. He's put all his chips on that one number on the roulette wheel mm. that he can't back out now. No. Uh, he, 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 it's almost as if the terrible things he's saying is better than backing out and saying he was wrong. <laughs> and he's not alone. Like you say, there's, there's, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands, even people who got themselves painted into this corner mm. and can't find a way out of it. I mean, I think it's really, I, I can see a mirroring of the kind of ethos and attitude from the local level government to the national level government. So for example, within the council chamber, when the last time I was there, like time before last, I think it was in De December, was it? Or yeah, I think it was December. And I took two motions. And um, one of them was to do with some stuff that had happened at a pride event where we had kids that were in and out of a tent where I saw two performances of striptease yeah. in that time. And there was the sale of dildos and whatnot. I remember you mentioning that on like, our last interview. Yeah. 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 And then there was um, the other thing. It was more about, uh, I think it was getting a, uh, a task group together around ideological capture within the council, having a look at which policies had been affected during our time as members of the Stonewall um, Equality Index scheme um, and how we could sort of de, you know, uh, sort of bring, um, neutralize them really, bring, bring them back so that they're not ideologically captured. And uh, I, in my speeches, I asked Mr. Menno, who is one of the, he's a, like a, he's a gay man who does regular YouTube uh, shows episodes on this issue he's absolutely amazing he's really really good he sometimes goes to the kelly j, j. let women speak events um and he's very flamboyant you know out and proud gay man and i asked him if he would provide me some words for my speeches for these two motions because you get two minutes if, you, if you've got them seconded you get them on the agenda you can have two minutes to introduce them and try and persuade people to vote in favor of debating them that's how it works so you get at least two minutes so I always try and cram as much as I can into those two minutes because I'm usually that's all I'm going to get. And in the past, they voted against debate. So I've had them two minutes and um, then they voted against debate and that's it. It goes off the table, but in the constitution, it has to go to a committee or to the cabinet. And what they realised there then is that if someone's in the hot spot for doing something about it. So with the trans inclusion guidance to schools, which had all kinds of dodgy policies in it that aren't even illegal, that had landed on the cabinet member's desk. And I was then hassling them by email. What's happening with it? You know, how have you got any further? Is there anything that's changed in it yet? What route is it going to go back out to the public by? You know, that kind of thing. They don't want that. So with these two motions, I um, I asked Menno for some words. He spoke as a gay man from a gay man's perspective as when he was a kid. Uh, he was a feminine little boy. He wasn't into football. He quite liked dressing up and girly things. He was very gentle. And he um, and a lot of gay men, you know, they they start out life like that. They're not. They're kind of atypical quite a lot of the time. They're gender non-conforming, you might say, which is absolutely fine. And he said if he had grown up in this day and age, he would probably have been persuaded he'd been born in the wrong body and gone hell for leather down that path because he did feel uncomfortable with himself and how he felt about himself in the world, and he would have been very vulnerable to that kind of messaging. And so he was speaking from that sort of experience. They always go on labour about lived experience. And he was speaking from his lived experience. One of the councillors in the chamber stood up and said to the chair, can we just stop her because this is tantamount to a hate crime? If she was speaking about black or brown people in this way, she'd be taken away and arrested. That was said about me. And, that, and all the labour were, you know, labour applauded that, you know, because they all feel pumped up on their virtue by it. And you yeah. saw the same kind of ignorance and self-assurance like overconfidence in the house of commons when sam dixon who's the uh, chester for mp and a bunch of other labor mps uh filibustered really really important reading of a bill in uh, which was related directly to protection of children um women's safe spaces you know and, and, and all of these issues they filibustered it by talking about ferrets and their pets names and ages and you know, genders at length um, in the morning session so that it couldn't be debated in the afternoon session and it might not be debated at all now. And they do it with such confidence. And I don't think they realise that to the average man or woman on the street, that is appalling behaviour. It's appalling contempt for the electorate. It's an appalling waste of the, of the parliamentary time, but it's an abuse of the democratic process. You know, it's both really, really deliberate. Um, I don't think they should be allowed to do that. And I'm hoping it's going to play 
you know, against them rather than in their favour whenever the general election is called. I really hope it will, because it, it's just extreme arrogance and it seems to be something that characterises the modern Labour Party and it's a shame that it does. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the, the what you mentioned there about virtue signalling, it's 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 true, isn't it, that the the power of councils as bodies, not necessarily the the, the co collection of councillors themselves, but councils as entities, have, have their their power's been hollowed out quite considerably mm -hmm. over the last few years, hasn't it? And so, what I was wondering was, do you think that the sort of virtue signalling that you've been witness to um, in uh, what's it, Ch Cheshire, up in Cheshire, is that is that um, is that a reflection of the lack of power these councillors feel they have? They can't change anything material in oh. in Cheshire West and Chester, but they can they can do this instead. This is almost like having some power to do something, but without changing anything material. I think they. I think they like the idea of having power, and I think that the role that they have is about that, and it's about status and the actual Labour Party branding and membership. They, I think some of them really enjoy, most of them are quite privileged themselves from privileged backgrounds. I think they really like parading their virtue. And it's like we talked about last time, it's almost like it's a benevolent, charitable, let's help the poor people type of club, rather than a social, a genuine social justice, like let's level the playing field, let's recognize social inequality, what causes it, and try and do something meaningful about that. So I think that's one thing is that they do probably feel a little bit frustrated that they don't have higher status than what they do within a local council but in terms of power to change things they have loads of power they have loads of power they complain that they don't have much money but they i don't know i i, I see them when they pick and choose their priorities of where they're going to spend that money it's very much on the virtue signaling things i've asked questions um how much money have we spent on that particular strand of equalities and protected characteristics within the Equality Act, as compared to all of the other strands, so disability, race, you know, sex, religion, belief, any of those in comparison to this, you know, this same-sex same, same sex attraction one. I wouldn't mind if it was same-sex attraction. It's the LBGTQ blah, 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 that, that is used to shut women up. Um, the, the amount of money, I can't even, they won't answer. They say they don't, they don't have that information, but they can spend shed loads of money on get, ratcheting themselves up this Equality Index performance and virtue signaling all over the place on things like that, and things on you know climate and environment and things like that. In terms of actual poverty, actually leveling the playing field and things, they've never, in my experience, been very interested in that. But the policies they, they have in place, so for example, with children in care, I did a freedom of information request and asked them, our children in care, um, what's our policy on that in relation to sex and gender? Do we teach reality? Do we teach fact? At what age do we start talking to our children in care about that? You know, as I'm as a counsellor, every counsellor is a corporate parent. We are supposed to take a responsibility towards those children as if they were our own children. And obviously, you don't get to know them. They don't know you. I could, you know, but it's kind of there would be senior staff members. It wouldn't be a relationship like a parent and child. And that's kind of right and proper. It shouldn't be. But we are supposed to take care about it as much as we care about our own children and hold the council to account as if they were looking after our own children. So I kind of said, you know, what's the youngest age that we would consider socially transitioning a child if they came to us and said that they were gender confused or distressed or whatever. They, they took ages to respond. They went past the response time. And then eventually when I managed to harass an answer out of them, it was that there isn't any younger, there isn't a threshold of, of the young, you know, and they don't have a policy on any of that. And we would, we would talk to them about it as any reasonable parent would. Well, <laughs> That doesn't answer the question because they are in their school's inclusion policy they are saying if the child is gender distressed or confused and they don't want their parent to know or be informed it's fine for the school to change their name um you know and address them change their pronouns and everything without informing that child's parent you know so if that's what they regard as how as being reasonable in terms of how you parent a child they would cut parents out of it, that equation at the behest of a child they know is most likely at higher risk of having experienced abuse or is you know at higher risk of having mental health problems parents need to know about stuff like that so they can keep an eye on their children um so they're not following the evidence um they're not respectful of parents and 
they have a lot of power to, to reshape policies and to ignore awkward questions and to ignore whatever the government is, is saying and to exploit loopholes and anything that the government leaves them to exploit. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think it's, um, I mean, part of it, you mentioned about the, 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 the some of the councils, especially in the Labour group, being privileged. Do you think their class background speaks to some of the things that they do? I mean, it, 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 I would have thought a, a council would have made, if it were from a perhaps more working class grounding, mm. might have been more concerned about dealing with poverty issues, homelessness, uh, child welfare, that sort of thing. But they seem to skip all that, perhaps perhaps because during their own childhoods, they didn't experience poverty or, you know, yeah. living on the breadline or, or worrying about keeping a roof over their heads. Yes. And so but, they go for these more fluffy, abstract topics instead to pursue. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I, I definitely think so within the Labour Party and um, and amongst councillors as well, because, you know, within the Labour Party, it's a very affluent space and the council chamber is also. Um, and anyone who wants to get on, either with it, say you are from a working class background within the Labour Party or, or as a councillor, if you want to get on and you want a more senior role, more responsibility and to be listened to within that club, you have to toe the line, you have to. So even if your instinct is, I kind of know this is wrong, I feel it, having to keep my head down on this issue, um, people are more inclined to because they're not going to. I think I think too many people in politics put themselves first. Um, and I think you're definitely right. I think if um, if no one has experienced that hardship or if they're not as in as great a risk, you know, of being put in harm's way as a result of that. Also, there's some theory that for some middle class parents having a child, that everybody wants some kind of a, what do you call it, some kind of a disadvantage formally. You know, everyone wants that. People feel a little bit guilty if they feel privileged. And so if you have a child that's trans that can make you stand out as a little bit different they've got particular rights that you can feel angsty about or whatever um or need support needs that you can claim to feel angsty about everybody's after a little bit of angst who doesn't who's not from you know from, who's not from a, a more deprived background maybe i don't know yeah yeah i mean it's a it's a phenomenon that's been touched upon by by other commentators in in the united states and to a degree here mm -hmm. is this uh privilege that comes from victimhood um, we, we attach a certain privilege these days uh, to victimhood um, rather than attach privilege to achievement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's very tempting for, for people to uh, paint themselves as a victim, mm -hmm. where if they didn't, they would be basically a very ordinary person mm -hmm. in a very ordinary crowd of people. Um, it's 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 part of one of the problems with I don't want to. Well, yeah, I'll blame it. It's late stage capitalism. It's where where you, we've got such an atomized society. Communities are completely fragmented and people find it very, very dis difficult nowadays to stand out from the crowd for achievement. Yes. So the best next best thing is to be a victim. And also maybe people don't know where they belong as well. So I've noticed yeah. that um, within the working class community, obviously most people, vast majority of people, they know what a boy is and what a girl is. And when they find out that, this has been quite an interesting thing, when people find out that puberty blockers have been prescribed to children, uh, since that's been announced this week, and, and I've shared that off my counsellor account, I've seen other people share it as well. It's been quite informative because previously, because you get these sort of flying monkey pylons of trans activist extremists, you're not always quite sure because a lot of them you know local people will get caught up in that and they'll be repeating those things or just be kind or why are you saying that or aren't you exclusive and isn't she a terrible bigot or whatever people can easily get caught up in that and you can't judge you can't really judge what the balance of views are but when an issue like puberty blockers and children drops in the news and then you share something about that you can see people waking up and you can see people like ordinary working class people from within the community going that can't have been happening you know so i think a big thing is that the, is that we definitely are seeing some working class people who are captured and it's maybe the type of people who will like a good fight and a, a good argument online and to give someone a load of stick it's those kind of people and they're very vocal and that can give the illusion that the working class is becoming as captured as the middle class has been on this issue um, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think what's closer to the reality is that you've got some quite vocal people that just love fighting online and they like giving a counsellor a load of grief. 
But behind that, you've got loads of people who've got absolutely no idea how serious this is and how far it's gone. And so the trick now is, I think, is for candidates for council and for you know the general election and police and crime commissioner, the candidates who care about this issue to find a place to land wherever that is. And I obviously the Party of Women is the place where I've where I've landed. Um, where you can speak openly and freely about these in your normal voice. It doesn't have to sound like a slick politician and you don't have to have an amazing array of informed views about everything else. At the end of the day, if child safeguarding is the thing that's at stake, we can trust ordinary parents and mums and dads and aunties and uncles and just general people who care about kids and their rights to be protected to make reasonably sound decisions on anything else that's put in front of them from my perspective. We're gonna do a better job than this bunch of idiots that are allowing this to happen and have been allowing it to happen for years and not spoken up either because of cowardice or because of some kind of virtue signaling, a desperate need to look as if they're a do-gooder, whatever it is. Let's get rid of those idiots or let's at least embarrass them into having to do the right thing if we can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and you mentioned that the party of women. Um, when you when you did your, your question or posed your questions at the Storyhouse Women Weekend, you were then an independent councillor and then you introduced yourself as such, but but you since then joined the party of women. Mm -hmm. So what was your journey from, from where you were the last time we spoke a few months ago to being a member of the party of women now? Well, last time we spoke, I think it was just after the woman had been assaulted by the masked fella by the Emily Pankhurst statue in Manchester at a Let Women Speak event. I've been following Kelly J like before, quite a way before that and I've followed her ever since to be honest I watch her her what she puts out on YouTube she's been banned this week but so she's on Twitter but or X but I've been watching those she puts them out daily and uh, because she's really smart so she probably knows you have to do regular daily content to really kind of get the reach yes. and traction yeah. but for me and I think for a lot of other women it's been a daily dose of sanity in just quite a stressful gaslighty situation to be permanently in you know um being silenced and then having everything reversed onto you like you're the aggressor like you're the abuser like you're the one who's being mean you know and and being unreasonable and uh causing people to get murdered and stuff like this yeah. it's um it's been insane and so that's that's really been such a massive help to me and when i saw her get um get uh, mobbed in the way that she did in New Zealand and maligned by the media in Australia and New Zealand as well. The treatment of the female politician over there, Moira Deeney, I think her name was. Oh my God, Riley Gaines, all of these things that have happened. I, it, I feel quite emotional when I see these things. It's exhausting to see this stuff passing across the news feed daily, it really is. I think, um, I mean, I was involved in getting a local group of councillors elected. We had us, we smashed it locally in the local elections here in Cheshire, Western Chester, in Winsford, which is the, where the ward is that I represent. Um, we got rid of every councillor on the town council. So we got 14 out of 15 seats on that. And then we got three out of the seven uh, seats in at the borough level in the same town. Never been done before. We created a brand. We um, promoted it in you know uh, like achievable policies which were not left or right it was just appealing to working class local residents to try and get a little bit more faith back in local politics labor did an amazing job of sabotage in that project so we we had massive electoral success and then it all fell apart or more or less immediately after the election so they still have a majority on the town council but um myself and simon don't really work closely with most of them some of them we do but not with most of them some of them who've said that they've distanced themselves from us because of my transphobic views, et cetera, um, have carried on working with him behind the scenes on things. Some of them have been pretty decent to me behind the scenes, but publicly they're terrified to be associated with me because I'm a pariah. So that little project that we that we managed to have amazing success with, it's been successfully sabotaged by Labour. So there's a lot of lessons that we've been able to learn from that, which may yet be of use um because this party of women obviously it's a brand new thing and kelly J is looking for people who've got experience of, of setting these things up and helping run election campaigns and stuff like that which i now have um just there's just certain things that we need to be more less naive about i think and more straightforward about with potential candidates right from the off so that we're not vulnerable to that kind of sabotage from within and, and without and um, so that's that it's been a painful year watching that disintegrate yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but also it's been a successful year in that I feel like I've managed to put the police on the spot. And then now even saying that the chief constable and senior officers agree that the police should be policing pride parades and events rather than participating in them, which I think is right and proper. So we have we are seeing some some elements of movement. But right from when Kelly J has been saying that she wants to set up the party of women, and even before that, in my own head, I've been thinking there's no other way. It's gonna have to be taken on, take the fight to them at that level, because although everybody's gonna say, Oh, well, it's a brand new party, and look what normally happens to those and do that. The fact of the matter is you cannot get on the telly any other way <laughs> on mainstream telly, but if you have a certain number of candidates standing for election, then they have to give you yes. um, exposure. You know, that we've got laws to protect that. They'll probably mess with them anyway. But still, the idea is, and I think this is the right idea, is that mm, probably most people are not making more of us about this because they just don't know how dangerous it is and how far it's gone. So it's about raising awareness, which is her whole thing. Um, and although she sometimes does get criticised because she'll say it straight and she says it in layman's terms, I think you have to do that to break through the amount of censorship and silencing that is, is ongoing and to reach people and let them know what's happening. There's a certain shock value to it because what's happening is absolutely shocking. You know, so. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you said that there right at the end about um, Kelly J. King's style and her delivery. And um, she's she's not particularly well. I, I don't want to say not particularly well liked amongst feminists, but there are certain feminists who who take a, 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 a objection to her approach and her style and the way she talks. But it seems to be more about not what she says, but the way that she says it, isn't it? Um, I mean, I don't know. She's uncompromising. She's not looking to compromise women's rights or language away. And I and I agree. I think someone has to hold that hard line, and you only get what you demand. And these are things that have been eroded and taken away from us. It's not that we're asking for more than we started with, but if you start shifting on any of that, you put women in danger. That's the reality of it. So she's not prepared to do that. And the same with children. And I just, I absolutely agree with her. And I think, yeah, you know, she's Marmite. You get a lot of jealousy. You get a lot of people who see someone building a platform and a brand successfully, and they don't like it. Um, they feel like they've been there before and they have, and that's stealing some of their thunder as well. You know, so I think, You've got to be honest as well about that potentially being an element of the of that but for me she makes me howl laughing i just i just think it's just such a dreadful situation to be in it's so upsetting and when when she speaks and she does these impressions that people probably find really offensive <laughs> i think is i think it's funny it makes me laugh i think we need to laugh we need to have things to laugh about owen jones is humorless most of the people on that side of the debate are humorless scotland had their freedom of speech ripped away from them yesterday. And there's a woman who's knitted, like, because the police have been using a mascot called the hate monster, and it's a red thing with angry eyes. And I'm like, ridiculous. And they've been using this hate monster uh, mascot to raise awareness amongst the public that these new laws are coming in and you can't say this and you need to make sure you're not doing that. And she's not knitted, but on her sewing machine, she's created a real, a real life hate monster. <laughs> and she's going to create like a video um you know content for, with it singing rage against the machine lyrics and stuff like that. <laughs> i just think like we're at a stage of the game now where you've got to geez we need people who can break through this we need people who can say it straight use humor and i think that they are things that she manages to do that no one else has really managed to do in the same way and um we need people to be aware of what's going on that's the bottom line so it's not going to change and we're going to be swamped like every other developed nation has been by it otherwise. yeah yeah and do you, do you think that that some of those feminists who have a problem with Kelly J. King do so from a class based position? Mm -hmm. Because obviously there's a lot of feminists who are from a slightly more privileged background, university educated, uh, maybe even have some political schooling. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Kelly J. King has come from from uh, more more working class roots, hasn't she? Um yeah. Was it was was someone who said in 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 interviews that she's done in the past she was someone of the left, mm -hmm. um, and and now is is considered to be a, a sort of neo fascist and a bigot by some people, um, not necessarily a fair charge of course, but you know it, it, do you think do you think some of the some of the issues that these feminists have with her is because of the class background? Um, yeah, it's just, I think it, I think it definitely is. I could kind of see it because. Um, 
I, I experienced that as well. You know, I think I think like we've said before, if you're from a certain class background, if you're more working class, you are more you're less inclined to think about um who you who you're sucking up to, who you're making friends with, who's going to help you get on, and how you need to rephrase things in order to meet their approval in order to get on, be approved of and not shock anybody, you know, not make too many waves, that kind of thing. It, it it's that all of the different elements of this movement are really important. Our academic feminists are really important. Um, the way that they're articulating their arguments and they're able to, um, you know, um, I don't know, hobnob within those upper echelons, I guess, you know, that's all part, an important part of it. Um, our women's rights network that go out in their knitted and crocheted things that don't want to make a fuss, but they're, but they're humorous and they're gorgeous and they're lovely women. Um, and some of them are quite privileged women, it's probably, but but not all of them are, you know, and um, they're worried about causing offence and their work is bread and butter work, it's really important as well, and we need Kelly J and we need people like Kelly J who are Marmite, that not everybody likes, that shocks, maybe, um, not everybody likes how she does things, but I get that in the council chamber and I think it is, it is a, there is a strong element of social class within it. Um, I'm not prepared to couch my language to please other people or I'm not in, I'm not there. I'm not interested in a career in politics. Most of us would rather be not talking about this stuff. We'd rather be doing something else with our time. You know, each of us has to play to our strengths and her strength just happens to be making waves and getting noticed and getting the message out there about what's happening in plain language. So, and now she's set up this party, probably the last thing she wanted to do or envisaged herself doing, but feels that it needs doing. And I think she's the right person to do it. I think she's the right yeah. person. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you haven't been in the, the, the party for women very long, but we're in a general election year. Mm -hmm. um, what are the plans for the, the party of women when the general election comes around? Depends when it is, because I think the deadline for getting application forms in for candidates for local government elections where they're happening is quite soon, isn't it? It's within the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It's it's This party's been set up quite late in the day before the deadline. Having said that, the group that I worked when we managed to get a massive landslide with last year, that was a ridiculously short time scale and I've been through that cycle once now. So I'm going to, um, I've had a, one conversation with Kelly J. We should be having another one in the next couple of days, but I'm going to do what I can if she wants me to, um, to help her, you know, see if we can get some candidates through. If they announce a general election, I'm not sure what happens there in terms of the time scales for getting people registered. Will it still be set in? Is that line in the sand movable? Um, I know Theresa May when we had the 2017 with when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader, it was a six week period. So the application date must have been imposed separately from, I don't know, any other election application dates. I'm not really sure how that works. I need to look right. at I don't know, but um, I, I'm interested in standing for it. I'm not already a, a councillor, but you can be, a, um, you can stand as an MP, you can stand as a parliament, you know, a police and crime commissioner candidate. It costs a shed load of money to stand for police and crime commissioners. So I don't know what kind of budget is available yet within the party to do that, but certainly the mess the police forces are in. Uh, I mean, uh, I just, yeah. Our, our own police and crime commissioner was pictured next to someone who, with a billboard around his neck, advertising for other people's children to come up and disclose their sexuality to them if they couldn't come out to their own parents with, um, you know, a child by the side of him, black, uh, blanked draped in trans flags. That was our police and crime commissioner and that was on his Facebook page for, for months. And I was emailing him saying, do you realise you've got this picture? And there was no response from him. So that's the, that's the depth of a mess the police forces are in. So I think any regular mum in any regular street could easily do a better job than that, really, of being a police and crime commissioner. We're really good at learning on our feet, mums are, you know. <laughs> so yeah. you have to when you become a parent. I mean, you know, so... And dads have to as well. So I just think there's mums and nans and, and, and just regular people out there that could do a better job than most of our police and crime commissioners are probably doing. And they could do a better job standing on their head. But in terms of the time scales for this general election cycle and the amount of money it takes, it's five grand just to register. And then, you know, maybe another 10 grand or or however to leaflet a whole police and crime area. Um, police crime area so. I don't know. <laughs> we'll it's it's to... difficult. And it, it's not just the money, is it? It's the volunteers that you need. I mean, yeah. I, I speak from personal experience, having stood as a uh, councillor in, in Tower Hamlets in East London. 
yeah. and and leaflet in literally hundreds of homes even in a short distance but on your own is mm. extremely difficult and it's do you, do you think that the, the party of women will be able to get the the foot soldiers so to speak to 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 do the work I do think so. I mean, I think if we're looking at priority seats rather than trying to blanket everywhere and we're looking at the number, the threshold number for MPs that we need in order to get televised on televised debates and things like that, then I think what we can do is try and pool our resources and, and send them to target areas. Do you know what I mean? Um, when we when we ran, when we stood our candidates against Labour, it had always been a, a Labour heartlands stronghold where we are. Um, and they they just thought we were a bit of a joke until they realised we had a full slate of candidates and then they sort of went, oh, and took it a bit more seriously. And then after a few weeks, when they could see people putting posters up in their window in support of us, they got really worried. And we've had sight of emails that were sent out to their candidates saying that they faced a serious threat. Um, this place, this place, and this place. And one of those places was Winsford. And they, indeed they did. And on the day of the election, they thought they were going to get completely wiped out. And if we'd managed to get registered and had our brand in time, we'd have had that on our uh, borough candidate um, ballots. And I think we probably would have wiped them out easily, completely. So, because it was very close on the seats that we didn't manage to get. So I think it's all doable. And I think that if you give people the motivation and you're enthusiastic and you've got a fun campaign and you reach out in different ways, I think that it's all doable. Yeah, we could be a massive threat. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so without giving away too much, are there any particular MPs you've got in mind to, to try and usurp? I don't know. I don't know. I've got some ideas. I don't want to say just yet because okay. I haven't discussed it with Kelly J. I need to have that discussion with her. I don't know who she's got in mind for seats locally. And if if it was someone that she felt could do a better job than me, I'm not going to, you know, I'm still going to support whoever that would be as well because it has to be a fair process. And so we'll yeah. have to wait and see about that. But I'd love to do it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope, I hope hope you're allowed to 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 have the chance to go for it. It'd be it'd be really good. It'd be really good. Thanks. Um. I think our time's coming to an end now, uh, but what I, what I, give, given the space of time that's the, there's been between the first interview we had some time ago and now, do you, do you think the tide is turning? It's such a difficult question. Such a difficult question because um, the most likely outcome of any general election, as we know, is that we're going to get a Starmer Labour government. And we already know that he's committed to doing the same thing with freedom of speech that Scotland have just done. Um, it's going to most likely get worse before it's going to get better. Um, there's going to be maybe a lag with people catching up on how bad this is and what how bad the implications are. And you can only we can only just keep pushing and hope that we are pushing enough and that we're doing enough that that backlash is going to come in a timely manner before it's kind of too late. Um, because in other countries where women haven't felt brave enough to go along and speak out in defiance of hate speech laws and, and things like that that are imposed on them, the whole of that society's sunk. It's lost. It's gone. There's no sign really of any kind of resurgence in most of those countries, other than the little bits of light where Kelly J has gone and done her events. And you've seen, you know, a little the beginnings of possible uprising. Whenever there seems to be some code, it's almost like it just gets covered over again. It just gets covered over that there's a loophole always left that can be exploited. And then it's look over here. There's so many different areas of this Hydra effects, really. It's like that game where you pop and you hit the head of the thing that pops up. Yeah. Whack-a-mole, yeah. that's the one. It's like playing whack-a-mole all the time. And they have a lot more money that they've been pumping into this for a long, long time before any of us were really aware of what was happening. So I just couldn't say, I know people who are newer into this when they see things like um, Penny Badenoch said something in parliament. She said the phrase trans in a way the gay. You know, people are using that kind of language and other people are, who are new, new into this fight saying, well, that's it now, that's it. It's just a matter of time before it falls, but it doesn't, you know. And then people say, well, that's great news about puberty blockers or WPATH, you know, leaked files, which show how bogus this, um, um, what you call it, a presumption of um, affirming kids rather than giving them counselling and exploring what issues might be going on. All of that, you know, people are like, that's it now, that's it now. It never has been up to now. So I just, I can't be too hopeful at this stage. I just feel like we need to make as much noise as possible. We need to have a presence on the national 
uh, mainstream media at our stage. And, and this is the only way to do it, really, because what we're doing with the party is winning. So. Yeah, absolutely. If I keep going. Keep going. Absolutely. Well, Mandy, thanks for joining me uh, today. Um, just before we go, um, I'll leave a link for the the short YouTube video of your star performance at the at the Story House Women Weekend in the description. But for anyone who's interested in finding your work, where can they see you? Well, I'm on X. I'm at Mandy Claire Tur. So uh, Mandy Claire, M A N D Y C L A R E, and then T E R F in capitals on the end of my name there. And I've got a councillor Facebook page, and it's Mandy Claire. Uh, uh, councillor Winsford Dean or something I can't remember the title of it but anyway if you search for Mandy Claire Councillor it will come up there's loads of all sorts of terrible 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 things about me online <laughs> and we'll we'll put the details to to those links to your account sir in, a, in our description thank you thanks thanks again as always it's been a pleasure talking to you Mandy and thanks for joining me today thank you good to see you thanks thanks